This video is a review of the chapter on multi-electron atoms. So in atomic units, we have things like the mass of the electron, the charge of the electron, uh, reduced Planck's constant h-bar, and 4 pi epsilon naught all set equal to 1, such that we express energies and are Hamiltonian in a convenient units to write down. And this makes the energy of a hydrogen atom equal to minus 0.5 Hartree's in this energy scale with these units. Then for the helium atom, we have our Hamiltonian, in this case expressed as minus one half del squared one, kinetic energy of electron one, plus kinetic energy of electron two, plus the attraction of electron one to the nucleus, plus attraction of electron two to the nucleus, plus the repulsion between the two electrons. And the repulsion between the two electrons is the key thing in multi-electron atoms that forces us to not be able to solve the Hamiltonian exactly, but forces us to resort to approximate methods. The experimental energy of the helium atom in Hartree's is minus 2.9033, and we see the performance of some approximate methods that we're discussing here. We have uh, second-order perturbation theory can do quite well, and Hartree-Fock, as we see, gets close, but often we need to go beyond Hartree-Fock to get very, very accurate molecular properties. Hartree-Fock, in general, is going to be a more qualitative theory. So the anti-symmetry principle for electrons says that if you have a wave function with many electrons, as we will with atoms which have more than one electron, that if you exchange any two electrons in the wave function, as we have here, by going from psi of 1, 2 to psi 2, 1, you have to switch sign on the wave function. And this results in the Pauli exclusion principle that you can have two electrons in the same orbital as long as one is spin up and one is spin down. You cannot have two electrons in the same orb spatial orbital with the same spin. That will be expressly forbidden by the Pauli exclusion principle, which arises out of anti-symmetry. Um, the way to build this in in general is to use what's called a Slater determinant, where we have a normalization constant out front, and then our determinant, if we expand it, includes all possible combinations of our electrons in all different orbitals, thus making them equivalent and then having positive and minus signs such that uh, this type of relation will be true by construction. The general theory which we're going to use which can get atomic orbitals in general for atoms, and then we can also ex extend this eventually to molecules as well, is called Hartree-Fock theory. So in Hartree-Fock theory, what you do is you take an individual orbital, that is a one electron wave function, and you expand that as a linear combination of atomic orbitals, which form a basis set. So these coefficients are what you're seeking to find to find the optimal atomic orbitals. And these atomic orbitals then combine together to form the total molecular wave function, which is expressed as a Slater determinant here. In order to calculate the energy of this Slater determinant, we need to uh, have some quantities calculated. We have the one electron operator H, little h, which includes the kinetic energy and nuclear attraction of each electron, thus only depends on the position of one electron at a time, called our one electron terms, and then the integral of that for a given orbital gives us a one electron energy. Then there are the terms which arise due to the interactions between electrons, and those include Coulomb and exchange integrals. Coulomb integral is kind of the classical electrostatic repulsion between two electrons, and then these exchange, orb these exchange interactions are a quantum mechanical effect which arise due to the anti-symmetry principle. And both of these are called two-electron energies because they both involve two electrons interacting at one time. Then our total Hartree-Fock energy for a given atom is going to be a sum of the one electron terms. Each electron is going to have a one electron energy. And then a pairwise sum over all of the electrons. Each pair of electrons is going to interact through a Coulomb and through an exchange integral, um, provided that they have the correct spins, as we'll discuss down there. So this uh, this approximation for how these electrons interact with each other through these Coulomb and exchange integrals is an approximation, and it's called a mean field approximation because the electrons don't feel each other explicitly. They only interact through this mean field, which kind of represents their repulsion from each other on average because we can't solve for this part of the Hamiltonian exactly. Um, then also in Hartree-Fock, we have the Fock operator, which acts on an individual atomic orbital, and the eigenvalue which it returns is the uh, orbital energy for that given orbital. And the orbital energy is often interpreted to be approximately the minus of the ionization potential for removing one, 
an electron from that atomic orbital. But note that the total energy is not a sum of the individual uh, el atomic orbital energies. That would be double counting the in interaction between individual electrons. So by seeking a minimum set of these coefficients to get the best possible atomic orbitals and get the lowest possible Hartree-Fock energy by the linear variational method, we end up with the Hartree-Fock roton equations where we have the Fock operator in matrix form acting on a coefficient vector representing in a single atomic orbital gives the orbital energy times an overlap matrix times the coefficient back again this is a kind of Schrodinger equation expressed in matrix form again and this whole procedure here is called the self-consistent field to minimize this total Hartree-Fock energy and uh, just by the way that these are constructed um, you have between electrons of the same spin, you have Coulomb and exchange interactions, but due to the cancellation of spin and the orthonormality of different uh, different spin up and spin down, you have through different spin electrons, you have just the Coulomb and you do not have an exchange interaction between different spin electrons. And that gives us explicit formulas for how we can calculate these total energies here. So Hartree-Fock is an approximation, as I said, so you can go beyond it to better approximations. When you're talking about post-Hartree-Fock, there are two things to be concerned about in electronic structure theory. You want to say, how accurate is my method for treating electron repulsion? And how large is my atomic orbital basis set? In principle, my basis set should be infinite. And in principle, this electron repulsion should be exact in order to get the exact answer. And that leads to many different approximations, Hartree-Fock theory, density functional theory, uh, mahler plesset perturbation theory, coupled cluster theory, and then the one which is actually the exact electron repulsion method, full configuration interaction, which is exact in the limit of an infinite basis set. Then using the results we can get from Hartree-Fock theory for the solving for the atomic orbitals of individual atoms, we can get electronic configurations. And these sort of match up the, to the general intuition that we have from general chemistry, this type of 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, etc. naming scheme for atoms. And there are some exceptions in there which are notable as well. Once we take into account spin-orbit coupling for atoms, we have atomic term symbols which represent the distinct uh, electronic states which are possible for a given atom. And these are indicated the same way they were for hydrogen, but now that we have multiple electrons, it's a bit more of an involved procedure to determine uh, what these term symbols actually are. And we have examples for carbon and for a hypothetical 3D9 atom for what those term symbols end up being. Then once we have the term symbols, Hund's rules tell us what is going to be the lowest energy term symbol for a given uh, electron configuration and tells us what the ground state's going to be and ranks all of the other states as well in terms of uh, what the values of spin, orbital angular momentum, and total angular momentum should be. And then finally, uh, in terms of atomic spectra, what transitions are allowed between what different energy levels based off of these different electronic states represented by these term symbols. We see that uh, the change in spin angular momentum should be zero, and the change in orbital angular momentum can be one, zero, or minus one, although not going from zero to zero. And also, similarly, for total angular momentum, we can have it change by one, zero, or minus one units. And again, it's not allowed to change from zero to zero.